At a raw hour of the early morning in a San Diego suburb, under streetlights the color of an alcoholic's urine, stands a 22-year-old man wearing nothing but boxer shorts and holding a baseball bat. He's standing there because he has heard a sound, the scratching of an animal, the echo of a cough, the note of a chain ringing against a flagpole that doesn't ever have a name, really. Inside the apartment complex, right behind him, waits his naked and bewildered girlfriend, whose body he has just rudely exited mid-coitus. <laughs> but she is less surprised than she is irritated, because this is the third time something like this has happened in as many weeks. And very soon, she will accuse him of being more interested in fighting than in fucking. And she is right, and that is awkward. <laughs> Actually, no, she's only half right. Uh, he would love to have sex with her all the time, if possible. She is young and fit and bright and a redhead and mostly Jewish, which is to say unencumbered by the sexual hang-ups of a Christian upbringing. The problem <laughs> is not with her. He has lost the ability to lose himself in the moment, and this includes during sex, where the consequences are very starkly apparent. But that's not to say he can't get it up. No, no. That shit would be merciful. What's happening here is much more mm, complicated. Uh, he is already, let's say, committed to the act. Yes. Mm. When a nameless anxiety spreads like a glass of spilled ice water down his back. The fight or flight impulse triggers. His heart begins to race, <laughs> and then his cock collapses inside of her like a bug on a windshield. <laughs> and then one of them has to think of something to say. <laughs> and it is never the right thing. <laughs> so, after a couple of rounds of going through this, he has graduated from merely fantasizing about charging out into the night after the things that startle him to actually doing it, except everything startles him, especially things that are not there. And he tries to explain this to her, but his vocabulary, it's limited by ignorance of his condition, but mostly shame. And she tries to understand as best she can, but no one likes being rejected so forcefully, especially not a 22-year-old girl and only by her third sexual partner. But it doesn't matter. None of this matters because he is convinced one day the sound he hears is going to belong to something that actually does need killing, and he's going to be ready for it because, you see, Erections have to be sacrificed sometimes for the greater good. It's all going to be worth it in the end. You're all going to see. So talking about yourself in the third person is a device of cowards. <laughs> it's a dissociative trick that allows both the confessor and his lovely audience a, uh, a conceit that the person that they're talking about is not actually a party to the conversation, when clearly they are. <laughs> and we appreciate this because it's polite, and I was raised to value politeness, and truly, truly, I do, but it has done me a disservice over the years. It has allowed friends and family a, a, a context for pretending that nothing is wrong when clearly there was. And so what happens in some cases was uh, we just saw less and less of each other over time, and in some cases, not at all. But there were exceptions. The, the girlfriend that I mentioned earlier, for instance, she made me promise when we broke up to go see a therapist. And seven years later, I finally kept my word. <laughs> and he was the kind of shrink whose receptionists have to sit behind protective glass, which is not a very flattering condition of speaking to someone and the walls were all adorned with plaques and degrees, and he must have earned every friggin' one of them because it only took me about five minutes to start talking before he interrupted me and diagnosed me with PTSD. He didn't bother even asking me why it had taken me so long to come in. He just said, oh yeah, no, you've probably been suffering from some of these symptoms from quite a while now, haven't you? Which is really not a question, is it? Get it? <laughs> But it didn't need to be, at all. 
The uh, the bout with impotence went away shortly after it began. Don't fret. Otherwise, I would have been in there years sooner. Boys and their toys, you know what I mean? Knock on wood again. Get it? Uh, <laughs> But in its place came this whole host of ticks and foibles, many of which are still with me today. For instance, there's a recurring dream where I'm fighting for my life, and just as I'm about to hit or kick back, I start moving in slow motion. And then right there at the moment of impact, I wake up. Sometimes just in time to see my cat go flying through the air like a stuffed animal. And Lana, it turns out, does not land on her feet when she's been asleep. The night terrors were brought to my attention by another, now, ex-girlfriend. Uh, when I woke up in the early dawn moments when it was still dark out to her crying hysterically and went, oh fuck, what's wrong, what's wrong? She said I had had my eyes wide open, staring at her and screaming at the top of my lungs, why don't you have a fucking opinion about anything? <laughs> There's knives under my pillows now, there's knives in the drawer beside my bed, knives in my car, just to mix things up, there's a lead pipe I have stowed in the driver's side seat, back pocket. All of this because of one night when I really desperately wished I'd had a weapon, and I did not. At 25, I discovered that I had a hidden Narnia of repressed emotions inside of me that could come flooding forth if I'd been drinking and the right trigger was present. And a trigger can be many, many, many things, but never the same thing twice. But the worst is what science calls, with fantastic succinctness, intrusive thoughts. These are like little flash bulbs going off that illuminate moments of shame or horror or guilt with such a, a vivid suddenness that I still snap my head to one side as though I could actually look away and sometimes this little Tourette's-ish sound will come forth like a whimper or a moan or a burst of profanity like, fuck, fuck, fuck! I have a very, very clear vision of what I'm going to look like if I ever become homeless and that is a very real concern of mine that life is just going to stop moving forward altogether and just devolve into this repetitive series of vignettes from my past because there's only one reliable context when life is allowed to just be and those are emergencies because I am really good at emergencies. I am fucking great at emergencies. I'm like a surgeon whose hands only stop shaking when he's actually in the operating room, and it's because I've been told I disassociate, which is a horrible quality in a lover or a friend or a son, but it's a fantastic one in a soldier or an aid worker, which is what I eventually became, just living that life, racking up interest on a credit card that I was terrified of ever paying off, and that's how you get all those ticks, just doing the sorts of things you do when there's a story you don't know how to tell. Denial's the easy excuse for why it took me so long to come in, but it's not true. Well, okay, it's a little bit true. But the real reason was guilt, because admitting that I was fucked up felt like I was sh stealing medals off of a better man's chest. This is a game that's easy to play when you're familiar with catastrophes, because it's easy to know someone who always had it worse for you. For instance, let's play. You saw someone get shot, at least you didn't get shot. If you did get shot, at least you didn't get blown up. And if you did get blown up, well, at least you're not dead. And let's just hope the dead are not so hard on themselves. <laughs> that's the silver lining I'm shooting for here. but. For the time being, at least, I'm not dead, and my body has very few scars on it that I didn't make for myself out of tattoos because someone else always caught the beating or the brick or the bullet. Someone else always failed in the attempt to resuscitate, and of every great unpleasantness in my life, all I did was witness, quietly, more often than not, like a ghost. And that's the worst thing that ever happened to me. I just kept getting lucky. I haven't explicitly wanted to go and die over it, but it's made me feel really shitty for being alive. And when you lack the capacity for suicide, the lengths you go to to end it are just bound by your incompetence. And I call them adventures. Each one motivated by maybe the next time I'd get it right. So late at night, in the middle of an unpaved street in a place where there are no street lights stands a 28-year-old man. He's a little worse for wear now. He has a hole in his left eye. 
And from his perspective, it looks like a little ball of nothing dancing just off center. And so to, to distract himself from the inconveniences causes, he makes a little game out of it, wherein he can disappear objects into his hole. Uh, for instance, he can make a partial eclipse of the sun for himself whenever he wants. And the reason he's standing there is because in front of him is a man, drunk, holding a machete, laughing and beckoning him to come closer. And the only safety is on the other side of that man. So even a dog knows not to turn tail and run when threatened, right? So what he does is he focuses just off center. He disappears the man into the hole. And he starts walking. And it works. He makes it. You see how far he's come? He can make a man with a machete disappear. A memory can't be far behind, right? It's all going to be worth it one day. You'll see. Thank you. Justin Hudnall.